the 1970s, the great inflation. Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners, said, you know what? I'm not doing anything this weekend. Why don't I go and read the Federal Open Market Committee transcripts, memoranda, and get a sense of what people were thinking at the time, as well as listen or read the transcripts of those famous Nixon tapes. Jeff, you set the scene in this article, which, by the way, you can find at Real Clear Markets, everyone. It was posted on the 15th of October, 2021. The title is The Power of Money Lurks in the Shadows. Jeff, you tell us right up front that 1970, there was a recession, unemployment, and therefore you should expect to see inflation uh, low because there's a lot of slack in the economy, but we didn't see that. That was what you, that's what everybody did expect at the time. We had a pretty, pretty nasty recession starting December 69, lasting until November of 1970. And through that recession, you would expect, you know, as you said, slack, resources, unemployment, all the usual problems that are consistent with recession should be, especially in any kind of Phillips curve conception, we should see a slackening of inflation, which did not happen. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Inflation was painfully consistent throughout the recession and its aftermath, despite the fact that more were unemployed and economic activity had fallen off dramatically, which was quite concerning and quite shocking to not just uh, economists and politicians, but central bankers too, because when we're talking about inflation, we're already in their domain. At least we should be in their domain. The, we refer to it as the great inflation of the 1970s, but the inflation began before Tell me, is it 1965 or 1968 to 1981 where the great inflation took place? What, what's it started the... around 65, but it really became serious around 68. So, I mean, you can date it however you want. To me, for me, it's 65 to about 82. Um, some people say 68 to 80. It's, it's really in that range where, again, inflation behaved regardless of economic behaved in a certain way regardless of economic circumstances, which everybody just started scratching their heads trying to figure out how this could possibly be. Now, we, with the benefit of uh, hindsight, say that it is because private enterprise, private banks began to work around the regulations that were in place at the time because they saw opportunity, money to be made, and they started creating new forms of money that were not captured by the Federal Reserve and the various metrics. That's why we believe that happened. But at the time, people were not clued in on that. Tell us about a meeting between. I'm not sure anybody's <laughs> clued in on it today either. <laughs> I think you know that's the. You and I are using hindsight, using the euro dollar lens, and thinking about that. Yeah, that's. We look at it as monetary evolution that was a, played a huge role in great inflation. But I'm pretty sure that that's not the conventional explanation. Conventional explanation is all off in la la land as it was at the time. And remember, we talked about August 1971, back when it was the 50th anniversary of August 71, earlier this August, when, if you remember August 15, 1971, or you just look back on what happened August 15, 1971, everybody says, oh, that's when they stopped gold convertibility of the dollar. That was sort of an afterthought. What Nixon and his administration really did was they confronted this great inflation that had just gone through a nasty recession without being deterred at all. They thought, well, what the hell's going on here? We need to do something. And they said, well, let's, let's control wages. Let's control prices. We'll set up wage and prices boards throughout the country. We'll staff them with these eminent economists. And they'll, if, you want a, if you want a pay raise, if a union wants to argue for a pay raise, they got to get permission from the government first. And that will stop inflation. So that's really what happened in August 1971 was the government took a top-down macroeconomic approach because they believed, as, as these uh, Oval Office tapes make plain, that the, as using President Nixon's very own words, the liquidity explanation was bullshit. That's what the guy said. That's what Nixon actually said on the tape, which was saying, look, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And in the early 1970s, they thought, well, how could it be a monetary phenomenon? Because the money we look at doesn't look inflationary. And the money they looked at was M1. And so you can see why Nixon in 71 said, first of all, the, the liquidity explanation was bullshit because M1 didn't seem to make it look like inflation was is going to be as bad as it was. And so if you thought that, then you would in August of 1971 would, would turn from, you know, you wouldn't blame the central bank. You would say, well, money supply looks fine. Let's start 
controlling wages and prices and let's blame unions and let's blame workers for these problems because it doesn't look like the monetary explanation holds water here. Even though the Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns at the time said, something serious is going on here. Economics itself seems to be breaking down because we expected in the recession of 69 and 70, inflation would tail off and it didn't. So we're missing something big. And that's really when that's really where this story really starts to get interesting as well as applicable to the current age. That's right. October 1971, President Nixon, Chairman Burns, and the Office of Management and Budget Director George Schultz were together. And to your point, the president used salty language regarding the possibility that it could be liquidity, too much of that. No, we move forward. Now it's February 1972. The administration is still blaming macroeconomic fa factors, unions, price increases, uh, but Burns is maybe not thinking, he's having a change of heart. Milton Friedman wrote a paper, maybe M2 is more important. He presented that to the president and the, did they decide to look into M2? Was no, it's, it, look, 1972, you also have to remember, was an election year. And you have to also have to remember something about the Nixon and Nixon administration, which was he blamed the Fed for his loss in 1960 when there was a double dip recession, 58 and then 60. And then there was that close election to John F. Kennedy, which he thought, damn, the Fed screwed him. And, you know, the, they, they tightened the money supply when they didn't really need to. And that cost him the election. So 1972, Nixon and Schultz and all the rest of his cronies were very much in favor of the Federal Reserve going full bore with money supply because number one, it didn't look like the money supply was growing as it should. And it didn't look like the money supply was responsible for inflation. And he was, you know, there's no way he was going to let the Fed cost him another election. So they were prodding and, and, and you know, coercing and talking about, you know, packing the Federal Reserve Board with uh, more Nixon uh, allies, all these all sorts of things to try to get the message to Arthur Burns, hey, go full bore with, with accommodative money supply policies, because at least until April or May of 72, when by then the election would be secured. So Arthur Burns was saying, wait a minute here, hold on here. Well, let's, let's not discount the money, ex the money explanation completely because it looks like a money explanation, number one. And number two, we're starting to get some, some scholarship and some hints and allegations that the M1 that we rely on maybe not be reliable. And that was the, the uh, paper that Milton Friedman had written in, uh, I think it was late 71, that said, we got to stop using M1. We got to start moving toward M2. And as, I, as you and I have pointed out throughout many times, Emil, the FOMC at that time were having the same discussions about how M1 was becoming obsolete anyway. So you have lots of staff presentations. You have a lot of academic literature saying, hold up on, on, on writing off the monetary explanation for the great inflation. We maybe we don't even know what we don't know yet. So that's why uh, Arthur Burns was wavering and why the president was saying, we don't, I don't care about this stuff. I want you guys to, I want the Federal Reserve as accommodative as possible. The FOMC was having discussions about M1, M2 at that time again, because they first considered it a decade earlier didn't they, Jeff, to investigate it? 61, 62, let's come up with a new measure. Am I right? That's when they came up with M1 and started to think about money, monetary terms more broadly, which then they settled into M1 in particular, even though there was M2, but M2 was sort of, a, you know, that's, that's the, the one that they kind of set aside and didn't really pay much attention to because they thought M1 monetary correlations, specifically demand for M1 uh, functions, seemed to work well up until around the late 60s, and especially this, the recession of 1970, which then gets into Arthur Burns' point where he testified in front of Congress and said, it looks like economics itself is breaking down because the last couple of years just don't make sense. That's an actual quote, ladies and gentlemen, that you can find in this article. Economics is breaking down. Jeff's not ad-libbing. That's what the chairman said. We move forward a few more years. Now it's January 1974. And I'm going to read a quote by Federal Reserve Board member John Sheehan. And ladies and gentlemen, the key word, the key word I want you to pay attention to is the very last word of this paragraph. Looking back over the two years that he had been a member of the committee, he, Sheehan, so I guess this is a memorandum, so it's not his quote verbatim, did not feel that the system had made a significant contribution to inflation. No, no. 
the rise in prices had resulted much more from spe such special factors as the devaluations and supply problems affecting foods and fuels than from an overly expansive monetary policy. And I didn't catch that at first, Jeff, but you say, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's right, but he's also missing the big picture. Yeah, he's, he's using the Nixon argument, right? Which is, we look at M1, and by M1, and our policies that are based on M1, the great inflation must be for some other reason. And I agree with him. He's absolutely right. Their M1 policy had very little to do with the great inflation, except in that it didn't, it didn't get in the way of the other monetary expansions that were taking place, which was supposed to be what policy was about. In other words, policy at that time was irrelevant. It wasn't wage and price controls. It wasn't supply factors. It was you guys were looking at M1 when you should have been looking at money differently. So monetary policy was irrelevant to the great inflation. It was because monetary policy didn't consider what commercial banks were doing globally, expanding the definitions and uses of effective money in ways that policymakers not only just failed to catch up with, they failed to understand, they failed to measure all those things, they failed to account for money itself during this great inflationary period. We're moving forward a couple more years. January 1976. This time, this uh, quote comes from a future FOMC board member, Lilo Gramley. At the time, he was a staff economist. And here he is saying that what we would expect is for M1 to be growing at 8.5% to account for the level of economic activity we're seeing. But in fact, it's only grown at four and a quarter percent. Why did you include this particular quote? Yeah, money demand is how they, they, look, they look at the money supply or they, they how to look at monetary conditions and try to make sense of them. So what they're saying is, look, this is 1974, 75, we're getting into the middle 70s and inflation is just not letting up. It's continuing to go. We tried, we experimented with wage and price controls and other things, macroeconomic policies earlier in the 70s, they had no effect whatsoever. We're starting to get the sense this really is a monetary problem. And we've been focused exclusively on M1. We told the President Nixon to focus exclusively on M1, which kind of maybe fooled ourselves into thinking there was no monetary behavior. But when we, put, when we start to add all of these things up, it just, it does not add up. The money demand function says that M1 growth should have been twice almost twice the rate as what it actually did in order to, in order to make sense of uh, nominal GDP growth and interest rates and inflation and everything else. So what they're saying is, look, it has to be the situation where our view of money is wrong because the economy is doing other things. The demand for M1, the actual demand for M1 was so low because the economy was using other forms of money that were not included in M1. So demand for non-M1 money must have been all through the roof, off the charts. And if you don't consider this, and you're only looking at M1 and M1 and demand for M1, you fooled yourself into thinking the great inflation is something that it isn't. And that's what they were starting to say in the middle 1970s, like, holy crap, we're a decade into this, and we're, started, we're just now starting to believe because it's becoming too much to ignore, or to dismiss, and to try to otherwise explain that, yeah, Maybe we should take this monetary evolution stuff seriously because M1 is leading us way astray. And by focusing exclusively on that, or even M2, it's leading us to these wrong conclusions, wrong policies, and therefore allowing commercial bank monetary explosion to take place without any constraints or checks upon it. And maybe that explains the great inflation far better than anything we've offered so far. Quote by Jeff Snyder, quite simply, during the great inflation, the U.S. and global economy had progressively turned to other kinds of money beyond the reach, even conception, of the Federal Reserve. Well, that's continued to present day, hasn't it, Jeff? Jeff, I that's really why to we, Yeah, that's why we're bringing this up now is because it's, a, it's, it's almost a perfect parallel to not just 2021, but the entire you know, last couple of decades where the same thing has happened. The Federal Reserve is not a monetary expert. In fact, ever since the 1970s, they said, we don't need to be monetary experts because we can't be. We can't keep up with commercial banks. So we have a now, now we have, since 2007, we have another monetary problem that the Fed is ill-equipped to handle, except this time it's not too much commercial bank money, it's too little. And now, exactly parallel, 
The Federal Reserve is leading the public into thinking all these other problems. You know, we talk about the lazy Americans and our star and all these other things. Anything to avoid having to admit that the last this, this last decade plus of disinflation or deflation around the world is a monetary phenomenon when it absolutely is. Again, we talk about the interest rate fallacy, all the signs and signals that say it is a monetary problem that were evident in the 1970s as an inflationary problem. We have the same issue today where the Fed doesn't do and can't do what everybody thinks it should do because it doesn't understand money. It didn't understand money in the 1970s. It doesn't understand money today. And if we have a monetary problem, what do we do? <laughs> we're kind of stuck. Just like the 1970s, where we're stuck with the inflation that was going on then. We're in the, in the 2010s and now 2020s, stuck with a disinflationary, deflationary problem. But the Fed isn't going to change, regardless of what happened earlier this year with consumer prices. The monetary background is the same either way. The Fed just doesn't really matter. As, as Mr. Sheehan was saying, we don't blame monetary policy here because monetary policy is, is mistaken and irrelevant. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff just mentioned disinflationary, deflationary pressures, and maybe you're scrunching your face, giving him the evil eye, the stink eye. How In a previous episode, we talked about how the recent month-over-month -month measures, a number of them, different various measures of inflation, are reading as they did normally before the coronavirus struck. They're at normal levels. So, Jeff, looking forward, is there... Where are we now, just looking forward over the next few months? It seems like we've got treasury bills coming back into the system that releases a pressure valve, but inflation is not accelerating. Uh, price increases are not accelerating. Uh, government stimulus checks are not coming. The Federal Reserve is still doing the same old, same old. So I suppose... Next few months, weeks, months or so will be less worse than what we saw in the summer of 2021, but we're still stuck in the same maybe 2018, 2019 doldrums of economic activity in the new year. At least that's kind of my outlook. Is there, what do you see for the next few months or do you have any concluding thoughts for, for this whole episode? Yeah, the, the lesson of the great inflation is that with it all depends on the monetary background. What is the monetary system doing? In the 1970s, regardless of what the Fed was doing, the commercial banking system was doing inflationary money. Therefore, there was an, an unbreakable, unrelenting, recessions couldn't even dent this. There was unrelenting inflationary pressures throughout. Flip side of that in the 2010s, the post-2008 environment, you've got commercial banks who don't want to do money. They don't want to do things. So you have disinflationary, disinflation or deflationary background which is kind of, it doesn't matter what monetary policy does, QE, tapering QE, level of bank reserves. It's all about the commercial banking system. So yes, even though consumer prices spiked earlier in this year, it wasn't because of money. It wasn't because of money printing. It certainly wasn't because of QE or monetary policy. It must have been for other reasons. And we know what those reasons were. As you just, you just mentioned several of them, Uncle Sam, um, you know, uh, supply bottlenecks, those kinds of things that for a couple months, Prices really did spike, but without the monetary component to it, it's not really inflation. It's something else. It was, you know, a temporary transitory factors combined to, to hit consumer prices. And ever since then, it was around April and May, not only have we seen consumer price indices start to decelerate, we've also seen, as we talked about before, twists and turns in the yield curve, which even though nominal interest rates are rising, which may, seem, may sound like a positive signal, the fact that the, the yield curve is twisting into a flattening sort of contortion, that sort of is a negative signal that's consistent with falling inflation, falling growth expectations, which is, hey, we're still in this same disinflationary, deflationary rut, and you can't rely on central bankers and federal reserves to tell you what's going on, because ever, like the 1970s, they have no idea either. In uh, episode 129, dear ladies and gentlemen, we talked about what banks are doing. Earlier, Jeff mentioned bank credit creation is the key here and we talked about it and there was even an article Jeff that you wrote that was called until this changes I don't expect any change and we talked about what US banks have done for the first uh, six months of this year and what they've done Cliff Notes version is they've taken on tremendous amounts of assets fantastic except they're all very 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 safe assets 
and actual net loans, the stuff we need to the real economy went negative. So not going anywhere anytime soon, I guess. Jeff, I enjoyed it very much. I'll talk to you again next week or maybe not next week. I'm actually going to take a break next week, Jeff. Yeah, you enjoy your vacation and we'll, we'll, we'll worry about the uh, yield curve contortions and yield curves having babies and clone <laughs> sheep and all the other stuff we've talked about this episode. We'll set those things aside for a week and come back at it a couple weeks from now. I need to get a hold of myself so I can enunciate, pronounce, and not bring up yield curves having babies. All right, good luck to the Buffalo Bills this week, uh, Jeff. Or are they on bye week? Who are bye they week playing? this week and they need it. I am so out of it. I don't even know who's playing it. Oh, God. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care, Emil.